President Biden's fiscal year 2023 defense budget is $773 billion, which is roughly an 8.1% increase year over year. The administration believes this is the amount necessary to implement the national defense strategy. So there are four major elements to the national defense strategy. One, defend the homeland with the pacing threat of China. Two, deterring strategic attacks against the United States, allies, and partners. Three, deterring aggression while being prepared to prevail in conflict when necessary. And then four, building a resilient joint force and defense ecosystem. So if the 2023 defense budget is an 8.1% increase over last year, why are seemingly so many people upset about it? So let's break this 2023 budget down by service, starting with the Navy. The Navy's overall budget would grow by 4.1% or $9 billion in the budget request. And we're talking about grow from the previous year. Major increases include a $1.9 billion boost to the Navy's research and development efforts, a $2.6 billion jump in procurement, as well as a proposed $3.3 billion increase in operations and maintenance funding. The Navy budget proposes $27.9 billion for shipbuilding, which includes purchasing nine new warships, two Virginia-class attack submarines, two Arleigh Burke-class destroyers, one frigate, one amphibious assault ship, one amphibious transport dock ship, one oiler, one towing, salvage, and rescue ship. So this proposal is down from the 13 ships funded in fiscal 2022. Now here's the part that's got some lawmakers and other interested parties let's say, concerned. The Navy proposal includes decommissioning 24 ships. Cuts would include nine literal combat ships, five cruisers, four dock landing ships, two Los Angeles-class attack submarines, two oilers, and two expeditionary transport docks. On the aviation side of the Navy budget, it's the first year the Navy plans to buy the MQ-25 carrier-based refueling drone. The Navy also announced a new fixed-wing trainer competition called the Multi-Engine Training System. The Navy would purchase 13 carrier-based F-35Cs down from the 20 funded this year. In all, the Navy plans to purchase 96 aircraft, which is down from 129 in the previous year. Representative Elaine Luria of Virginia, who is a Naval Academy graduate and a retired Navy Commander Surface Warfare Officer, went after this budget with a tweet storm. She tweeted, I have delayed putting out a statement about the defense budget because frankly, it would have been mostly full of words you might expect from a sailor, but here goes. It sucks. Once again, this administration has chosen the divest to invest strategy as if whatever future conflict will not occur for at least two decades. Admirals Davison and Aquilino disagree. Now she's referring, of course, to the former and current heads of Indo-Pacific Command, respectively, and their testimony on the Hill about the time frame that China might actually go after Taiwan. Now, in subsequent testimony, Representative Luria and the Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, General Milley, had an exchange about their interpretations about what the admirals meant. Listen to this. I think that we've mitigated risk relative to China, mm -hmm. and I think that the probability of armed conflict with China uh, the consequence would be high, but the probability is not high in the near term in terms of this particular budget. Uh, now, as you well, get in the out years, yeah. as you get in the out years, what do you define by I think out that years? the out years is beyond five years. So okay. beyond so the that fight does up. not concur with what we've heard from Admiral Davidson and, and Admiral what Admiral Aquilino Davidson and said and Admiral Aquilino said was they said that the probability uh, or the uh, capability of China to attack Taiwan is going to be 2027. Capability, not probability. Okay. And, and that is exactly what President Xi charged his military to do. Okay. Well, I would say that myself and many others on this committee interpreted Admiral Aquilino and Davidson's statements differently. But as we're That's limited true. in they time... They were interpreted differently. But what they um, said was the I, capability to attack Taiwan was okay. to be developed by 2027. That's not the same as a decision to attack one. I think that they said that there was a high probability within the next six years, now five years. And they I've had that it, conversation directly with increased. Admiral Aquilino. All right, back to Representative Luria's tweet storm. The Navy owes a public apology to American taxpayers for wasting tens of billions of dollars on ships they now say serve no purpose. They propose decommissioning 24 ships, 11 of which are less than 10 years old. One has been in service less than two years, and two are currently in modernization all to save 0.5% of their budget. This, along with an anemic building program, will shrink the Navy to 280 ships. At the same time, they're calling to build a 500-ship Navy. Hint, if you want to grow the Navy, stop decommissioning more ships than you build. 
China is not a, quote, pacing challenge, end quote, when they will soon have double the size of our Navy. We are losing 1,000 plus VLS cells, those are the vertical launch missiles on Navy ships, with all caps, no plan to replace them. Instead, we are investing in the next, quote, Gucci missile and technology that will not be mature for 20 plus years. Lastly, the Navy has no strategy. Stop saying you do, because if you did, you would be able to explain how this fleet size will allow us to defend Taiwan. So that's quite a tweet storm aimed at a Democratic White House coming from a Democratic lawmaker. Recently at Commander Salamander's Substack, retired Navy Captain Brian McGrath wrote a column called When Bad Strategy Drives Resources. I recently sat down with Brian at McGarvey's here in Annapolis to get more of his thoughts about the Navy's portion of the 2023 defense budget. Here's part of that conversation. Where, where um, Ms. Luria believes that the Navy doesn't have a strategy, I believe what the Navy is doing is resourcing their service as best they can to fit the strategic requirements they are being given by the administration. It's a different thing altogether than not having a strategy, but in this case, it's just as bad. Some of the terms that you use and the distinctions you made are punishment versus denial. Talk to us about what that, yeah. the, those different things are. When you want to deter another country, um, one of the classic ways is uh, assuming that you have the will to do so and the capability to do so, uh, is by punishment. And that is, if you do X, we are going to bomb you into the Stone Age. We're going to make, you know, put your civilization back. We're going to kill people and wreck things. It's going to be ugly. It's not worth the pain. That's deterrence by punishment. Deterrence by denial works a little differently. And what you're trying to do with denial is to get into the decision loop at a point where the, de the decision makers are figuring out whether what they're going to try is even going to work. And so what it does is it requires you to put a team on the field that enables you to get in the middle of the way things are and the way things have to be if they succeed in their aggression. And if you can be in the middle of that and if you can muck it up and if you can present them with a series of operational dilemmas that they have to solve that raise the cost of their aggression and make the outcome of that aggression less positive, less of a sure thing, you can deter them from even trying. So it's not that they're worried about getting bombed into the Stone Age, it's that they're worried about what they're going to try even working to begin with. Um, denial requires more Navy, more resources. It requires ships and airplanes and submarines networked with weapons, sensors, space, everything out there all the time. Making the other guy believe today's not the day to do my, uh, to do my aggression. Punishment enables you to take some of that force back. In fact, places a premium on the ability to generate overwhelming force so that uh, when they have started their aggression and when they have succeeded in their aggression because if they decide to test your deterrence regime uh, uh, against a punishment approach they're going to succeed they're going to get what they want the problem is keeping it at that point and our and by punishment what you're saying is i'm going to knock you off that it's expensive in treasure it's expensive in blood it's tough to do but it, you don't have the day-to-day -day costs of getting in the middle of their plans, which denial requires. What are we doing in terms of the programmatic priorities and the program record, and does that jive with what we should be doing? I believe that what I have seen comports very closely with the way the administration wants to pursue its broad strategic goals. As a navalist and as an advocate for naval power and sea power, I think that they are missing the boat, so to speak, in that uh, in the security environment we face, 
rising China, uncertainty in Europe, naval forces will play an important role, as they always have. And secondly, naval forces play a unique and critical role in the nation's prosperity and security. That doesn't even get factored into force structure very well. I honestly believe that the program the Navy is pursuing that gets rid of a bunch of LCSs, that retires some cruisers that might have some use, some, some time left in them, that slows down the building program of the big amphibious ships. Uh, I think their approach fits the strategic shit sandwich they were handed by the administration. That's what uniforms do. Uniforms follow the orders they're given. That's something we should expect, and it's something I think we should prize and treasure in our country. Um, the CNO has gotten, yeah, in, in my view, has gotten orders like, hey, this is, where, this is what we're doing. We can't afford your large Navy. We can't afford to be present and forward to the extent that we would have been under the previous administration's deterrence by denial approach. We're gonna pursue deterrence by punishment. We're going to question forward presence. We're going to, we're going to prize uh, uh, surge capacity that we can bring over the horizon and, and, and punish aggression with, but we're not gonna to try to anticipate aggression and get in the middle of it because that's too expensive. And we have other priorities in the domestic economy that we, sh we wish to address. So it's, it is, it's being driven from the top down. So the Navy's, I think, making short-sighted, terrible decisions. I would like to see most of the force structure that they're getting rid of retained, but they don't have any choice because they're not being given enough money to retain that force structure and pay for all the people and the programs that they have and invest in the future and keep the current force ready. They just don't have enough money. So they are trying to shed force structure that is uh, less useful to filling the strategy that the administration is pushing on the Navy. So is Representative Luria going to alter their thinking? I mean, here's a Democrat who's openly and aggressively criticizing the Biden defense strategy. Deputy Secretary of Defense Kath Hicks worked on a project at her think tank before she came into government, and it's called Getting to Less. And it, and it started with this, the, the supposition that at the time, all of the major candidates in the Democratic primary had very aggressive domestic priorities that would be very expensive, and that her, her thesis was we couldn't spend as much on defense. We had to get some money out of that in order to pay, whether it was Biden or Warren or Bernie Sanders, it didn't matter. Whoever came out of the Democratic side was going to lay claim to some of that money. And her theory was, how could we spend a flat defense budget better and, and hedge our risks? So she's been thinking about this a long time. She's, a, she's an executive branch uh, animal. Uh, uh, Representative Luria is from the legislative branch. Um, they have the power of the purse. I think Congress is, is uh, in a bipartisan way, ready to see more money spent on defense. The question, though, is ultimately whether the president agrees, whether the president's security apparatus agrees, and whether uh, they're going to spend more money on a bad strategy, or whether they'll change their strategy to make use of the additional money. So if the strategy becomes a good strategy, does this mean more shipbuilding? Do we focus on our shipbuilding capabilities? Yeah, it means, it means a lot of things. Uh, it, means, um, it means taking better care of the fleet that we have, which means increased money for readiness. It means buying the people that we need, which means more money for people. It means, it means looking at hot production lines and seeing if we can, you know, we're, we're, we're struggling budgetarily to build two large surface combatants a year. I think if you talk to the shipyards, they would tell you that they could do a 232323 profile, or maybe even get to eventually to a three destroyers a year profile. 
there's just no money to do it. So if there were money, I would want to lay it in on hot profiles, the DDG line, the LPD-17 line. Um, I look forward to the FFGX maturing, getting on the right side of the learning curve on the FFGX so that we can uh, begin to build four of those a year, which is, I think, a, a Navy plan. I don't think we're ready to do that early in the program. So we can build stuff in hot production lines, a little bit more of those now. And quite frankly, we can look at stuff like small fast patrol vessels with a quad pack of surface to surface missiles and put 50 to 100 of them in the first island chain uh, to just be pains in the ass. The, the operational concept is you know, choke point control is surface to surface missiles. It's being part of the network in peacetime. Peacetime deterrence, they are probably less capable once the shooting starts, but that is a choice this administration has made. This administration has chosen to concentrate on those elements of the naval budget that are most useful once the shooting starts. There are a whole bunch of things that are of diminishing utility once the shooting starts that are really, really useful in keeping the shooting from starting that they're walking away from. For instance, LCS, right? We're, we're going to get rid of some number of LCSs, some of them brand new. Uh, if the Navy had the money uh, and if the Navy had the strategy pushing them, my guess is that there would be, they would be open to the suggestion that we forward deploy LCS uh, in uh, in the Western Pacific, give it the give it the supply chain it needs, give it the maintenance it needs, and the people they need, and have a proper set of twenty or twenty five warships out there in the Western Pacific who do modest things all the time, and who who are constantly saying, "I have missiles, I have fuel, and I have American hearts and brains. Don't mess with us." It's part of a deterrence uh, posture, and we're, we are devaluing that with this budget. Is China the pacing threat? China's a pacing threat for the Navy. And this is one of the problems, I, th I think, that we see in the Department of Defense, the last one and this one, is they want to have a pacing threat. I think the pacing threat for the Army really ought to still be in Europe, really ought to still be Russia. I think the Army continuing to try and base its force structure on a pacing threat of the People's Liberation Army in China, I think that's silly. I think the Army ought to really be thinking about Europe. Looking at the budget, it appears the Army is thinking about Europe. Their overall budget number goes up $3 billion year over year, and that is driven by increases in operations and personnel accounts while their weapons spending is taking a cut. The Army is also looking at a cut in their overall active duty troop levels. So obviously all of this is happening as the U.S. sends more troops to bolster NATO's Eastern Front as a check on Russia. This budget request supports 998,500 troops, which is a decline of 12,000 from the personnel levels authorized by Congress this year. The Army plans to purchase 35 remanufactured Apache helicopters, the AH-64E models, 25 UH-60M Blackhawks, 72 armored multi-purpose vehicles, 29,000 of the next generation rifle, 252 enhanced Patriot missile systems, which is up from 180 this year, and 120 precision strike missiles and 32 integrated air and missile defense systems. The budget also asks for Army research to back the prototyping of a long-range hypersonic missile, a mid-range missile, and a precision strike missile. On the Air Force side of the budget, Secretary of the Air Force Frank Kendall has said he's looking for a transformation, not an evolution, which sounds like his version of divest to invest. Sound bites are important in the Pentagon. And he is doing this through an aggressive retirement effort. So the Air Force is seeking $234.1 billion, which is up $180 billion from last year. They're cutting 100 MQ-9 drones 22A10s, which is going to cause some hue and cry as it did the last time they tried to cut the A10 without any replacement aircraft that can do 
the close air support role the way the A-10 can. Remember last time they tried to make the F-35 into a close air support platform, and that was shot down by anybody who knows anything about that mission area. They're retiring 33 F-22s, 8 J-STARS, 15 AWACS, 50 T-1 trainers, 13 KC-135 refueling aircraft. And they're going to replace those with 33 F-35As, 24 new F-15EXs, which Secretary Kendall says has more weapons capability than the F-35, which is an interesting takeaway, and a new sensor suite for the F-22s that are going to remain in the Air Force fleet. They're also going to buy 4,200 JDAM kits that can turn dumb bombs into guided munitions. Now, as we're talking Air Force, naturally that leads to a conversation about the Space Force. Remember them? So they're requesting $24.5 billion for fiscal 2023, which is a significant boost from the $17.4 billion they requested in 2022. Most of that is going to go to a space missile warning, missile tracking, and space launch capability. But perhaps no service has faced as much criticism for their 2023 budget proposal than the United States Marine Corps. Now, this budget is based on a white paper that Headquarters Marine Corps put out last year called Force Design 2030. And in that white paper, the Commandant attempts to explain the choices that he's making against the budget that he's got and the capability that the Marine Corps believes they're going to need in the years to come. Basically, the Marine Corps plan is to get rid of three active duty infantry battalions, which will take them down to 21, get rid of two reserve infantry battalions, which will take them down to six. They want to reduce each battalion by 200 Marines. They're getting rid of 16 artillery batteries, which will take them down to five. They're increasing their rocket artillery batteries by 14, which will give them 21. They've already gotten rid of all of their tanks, they're increasing their light armored reconnaissance companies by three, which takes them to 12. And they're getting rid of two assault amphibian companies, which will take them to four. On the air side, they're going to have 18 VMFA squadrons, which is basically F-35B squadrons. But they're reducing the airplanes in each squadron from 12 to 10. They're getting rid of three of their V-22 squadrons, which will take them down to 14 of what they call their medium tilt rotor squadrons. They're getting rid of three of their H-53 squadrons, which will take them to five. That's their heavy lift capability. They're getting rid of two light attack helicopter squadrons. That'll take them to five. They're increasing one of their refueling squadrons, which will plus them up to four of those. And they're also going to increase their unmanned aerial vehicle squadrons by three to six. So those Force Design 2030 priorities inform the Marine Corps 2023 budget, which is $50.3 billion, which is nearly a 1.8% increase over the $49.5 billion they requested last year. Now, as you might imagine, getting rid of all of your tanks and a lot of your infantry troops does not play well with the veteran community. In fact, none other than former Secretary of the Navy and Senator Jim Webb, Naval Academy graduate and Vietnam-era Marine, wrote a Wall Street Journal op-ed that pretty much laid into the Commandant's choices with respect to prioritizing the future war against current capability. Senator Webb was joined by 40 retired general officers, including every living former commandant of the Marine Corps. And that's a very significant pushback from the Greybeard community. And their criticism can be summarized as the commandant is hazarding current readiness in favor of some future capability with a lot of unproven technology. So when you say unmanned, you say AI, you say cyber, the old guard looks at that and said, that's unproven technology, so it is foolish to over leverage the budget against that capability. Now, the Commandant has pushed back and basically said, thank you for your interest in current Marine Corps decisions, but I got it. And I've heard from other defense experts, like we heard from Brian McGrath about the Navy budget, that if you want to fund current readiness, in addition to keeping pace against China and future threats, you're going to need a bigger defense budget. Every one of the services and those who advise them with this budget are confident that these are the right moves against the fiscal environment. So the services are transforming, not evolving, and they're divesting to invest. But 
As critics are saying, in the meantime, as demonstrated by the Russian invasion of Ukraine, you can't always predict when you're going to face the next threat. All right, that's going to do it for this episode. If you're a first-time viewer, please ring the bell and become a subscriber so you don't miss anything. Give me the likes and comment. Check the links below for merch, including Where to Get the Punks Trilogy, my first three books about life in an F-14 squadron, available both in print and now for the first time as a Kindle. So go to Amazon.com for more on that. If you'd like to help support the channel, please consider using the super thanks, the heart icon below, or become a patron at patreon.com slash wardcarroll. And in the meantime, I look forward to talking to you again soon.